Well, welcome. Did you know that 50 million years ago, about 50 million years before Yellowstone, Yellowstone eruption occurred only about 600,000 years ago, but 50 plus million years before Yellowstone occurred, there was even a larger volcanic system in northwest Wyoming in the vicinity of Yellowstone. It overlapped some. And they were gigantic strata volcanoes, huge, tall ones, 20,000 feet high above the basin floor, and there were a series of them. And, and they were very explosive. And they had a habit of creating landslides. And one of them turns out to be the world's largest landslide, which is referred to as the Heart Mountain uh, Slide. And so we're going to learn about this amazing geologic feature and see just how it happened and see where it happened. So I'm excited about this. I think it's time to get going. Let's go. Okay, I want to start by orienting ourselves in the world. This is a view, and a Google Earth view, of the northern United States. And the state of Wyoming is outlined in this blue. Now we're going to zoom in here as we rotate in and we're going to focus on the northwest part of Wyoming where Yellowstone Park happens to be. And this red outline you see, that is the mass of land that broke free and many large blocks slid out from that area. Continuing to zoom in, we see some more features here. First of all, I want to point out these green outlines. The big one is Yellowstone National Park, and the smaller one next to it is Grand Teton National Park. Of course, we see the red outline of where everything broke free, and two, the two green dots out there are landslide blocks, some of the blocks that slid out. I've just highlighted a couple. There are many of them. The small green dot is Heart Mountain, and the two yellow uh, splotches here very interesting because those are two of the big active volcanoes in that particular area at the time. Okay, so here we are at the famous Heart Mountain here behind me, the mountain behind me. I say famous, it's famous at least in the local community. It's well known uh, because of over the years there are many geologists that have come and studied it and there are little write-ups in the local papers, right? In the geologist community, in the structural geology, those specialized in studying the earth deformation and things, it's very, very well known. The broader geologic community, not so much, which is kind of amazing to me. Of course, I'm a bit biased because I grew up in this area. But uh, Heart Mountain, you know, it was well known to me as a, a kid. Uh, could we drive into Cody? I'd look at that mountain pretty much every time driving in to get our groceries. I go, you know, that looks like a witch lying on her back with a big old wart on her chin. So my imagination was working on Heart Mountain early. That, all that said, if we come back to the geology story, what many people, of course the locals that aren't specialized in geology and stuff, but even many, many geologists don't really know that Heart Mountain is a very small part of the bigger picture. It turns out Heart Mountain is just a small little piece of the big, the big landslide. It turns out that this mass of earth that came detached and came screaming out, as I like to say, into the basin uh, was 20 by 30 miles in size or so. 800 plus feet could be two, three, 4,000, we're not sure. There was huge, it could be several thousand feet thick of volcanics that were on top, volcanic deposits, and all that that came rushing out. It was just, it must have been unbelievable. And I'll, I'll reveal a little bit more right now, and that was it also came out at very high speeds. Modern work and modern technologies that we're able to do, the geoscience, the geology community have been able to show that. So what an amazing story. I'm sure looking forward to having you along with me to learn about Heart Mountain and the largest landslide on Earth. 
Even part of it is in Yellowstone National Park. Believe it or not, everyone knows about Yellowstone. But we're going to start off by going over to McCullough Peaks here now, nearby. And there we'll start talking about, get more into detail about this amazing story. This, uh, this is going to be fun. Let's go. And here we have, in the beautiful Badlands, one of the McCullough Peaks. And just to the left is Heart Mountain. Well, I've made it, made it here. I've done a little brief hike down from the pickup truck down into this little hollow near the top of McCullough Peaks. And uh, this is where we get the first perspective of Heart Mountain. So Heart Mountain is back through that notch. Uh, let's see if I, if I can point to it uh, somewhere over in here. Hopefully that's about right. Uh, Heart Mountain back in the background and in the foreground are these beautiful red uh, red beds of the Willwood Formation, which are quite young, okay, about 50 million years old or so. So that gives you a setting um, and a feel for the landscape right here in this immediate vicinity. But Heart Mountain is so fascinating, and I like to think about it from a geologist's perspective and what, what it would have been like to hike out here and observe this as a geologist that first was unfolding the geology out here at the turn of the century, these early geologists like Darton and others that were out here studying the geology of the Bighorn Basin. And uh, <clears throat> that's why I came here in particular, because I want you with me to think about what a geologist saw and how they might think about, well, what's going on here? Okay, over here at, at Heart Mountain. Okay, so to start off, I wanna have, start with a, a basic understanding of stratigraphy and how geologists think about the layers of rock or what we call stratigraphy. So I'm gonna grab a board. Uh, and here is this, uh, stratigraphic column that we call it. That's the age here, starting from the oldest and going to the youngest. These are the age names that some of you may be familiar with. And this is the names. We give names to all these layers. They're kind of like our own babies. You know, they, we know these like the back of our hand, like our own kids. And they're very distinctive, these big layers of rock. Just so you get an understanding, this blue, light blue layer here happens to be 400 feet. It's the Maori formation in this case. Uh, some of them, uh, this shale here can be 2,000 feet thick, called the Cody Shale. So each one has its name and has a typical thickness uh, out here in the Bighorn Basin. Now, <clears throat> so with that in mind, the old geologist back in the day, I like to imagine they came right out here, right where we're at right now. And I want to, I want to ha have you... Uh, think a little like a geologist and what it might be like. I know it's interesting to me, and that's kind of the way I think anyway. So here we are, the geologist. And I'm, we're standing here, and he's standing here, and we're going with knowledge, basic geologic knowledge. We look over at Hart Mountain and we go, uh, what? What? Why am I saying what? Let me give you a clue. Since these geologists know these rock layers, I mean, they're distinctive, they can, see, they can tell them many miles away usually, right? He's going, I, gosh, Heart Mountain over here, I know what it looks like. It looks like it belongs from down here in the Bighorn Dolomite, which is about 400 million years old. And you're thinking, well, okay, uh, so? <laughs> well, there's something interesting. I've shown you all these red beds around here, right, to start off. 
these banded beautiful red beds. Well, it turns out if you hike uh, over here and you can see it from here, but especially on the other side, and he would kind of understand that, a geologist would, that these red beds are sitting right underneath Hart Mountain. And what that means, these red beds are up here. They're 50 million years old, and we're observing rock that's way old, that belongs way down at the bottom, clear at the top here. Now, how does that happen? So in other words, let me try to simplify this even more. The geologist that's knowledgeable goes, the rock that's sitting up there on Hart Mountain should be 15,000 feet underneath it, not right, right where it is. Okay, so now we, have, now we have a problem, don't we? An exciting problem. First of all, as a geologist, you're going, well, I could be wrong. Maybe there's a layer of rock over there that looks an awful lot like the Bighorn Dolomite that's completely new, that's very young or something strange. So I've got to go over there and verify what that rock is as I'm standing here, you know, 15 miles away or whatever it is. Okay. That would be the first step, of course. But I'm talking here assuming that it is this old rock with you guys. Okay, so, <clears throat> wow. There are different ways to get old rock on top of young rock. And immediately the geologist would be going, uh, uh, gosh, if that really is bighorn dolomite, if that really is this old, old rock sitting on these young, beautiful, badland rocks, there are about three ways to do it. And that's, I'd be immediately thinking this way and going, well, the first would be a big landslide off the steep front of a mountain, you know, where you have old rock that's been pushed up way up in the mountain. And there's young rock down low in the valley. And this big rock just comes off and goes down on top of it. The other one would be a thrust fault. And that is uh, very quickly, and I'll, I'll repeat it later, is that when rock, if, the, if my hands are a layer of rock and you compress them, they can break like this, literally just kind of break along a fault and one big section can slide on top of another. And you can get old rock on top of young rock. Okay. Uh, and actually many geologists thought that could be the case here at Hart Mountain for quite a while until it was studied more. And then finally, the third option, which ends up being what happened as these geologists studied it more, and we'll go kind of act like we're early geologists, that's kind of fun, is another type of landslide called a low angle detachment. The rock slides on a low angle detachment from some place high and gently slides out, in this case, into the basin and old rock gets way up 15,000 feet above where it should be in the, in the column, in the, in the layers of rock, okay? And we're gonna explore these uh, ideas and these options, and we're gonna learn about these. And using very basic uh, geologic principles, we're gonna figure out what happened at Hart Mountain. And believe me, it is some story. Well, here we are, hiking up towards Hart Mountain. And I'm trying to imagine, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as a geologist back in the day, as he approached, he's, he's, as he approaches the mountain, he's thinking, well, this is looking more like the, the older uh, formations, like the, the Bighorn Dolomite or the Madison Limestone. And he's starting to think, I think my initial impressions are right, that this is really old rock sitting on younger rock. And uh, so it gets more exciting as you get closer to confirm this, because this makes this a very interesting geologic puzzle.
So as we're going on up the hill, I wanted to point out something. You see the terrain here in front of me is kind of bummocky. Hummocky, excuse me. Terrain is hummocky. I feel bummocky, uh, but meaning it's bumpy. And there's a word for that. And you see how it's humpy all over, small little hills. So this hummocky terrain comes from the weathering of shales and mudstones. And this is what we'd expect from the weathering and erosion of the Willwood Formation. Now, another thing I wanted to point out is uh, we've come here where there's quite a bit more rain. And so everything is covered in grass, unlike the Badlands that we were at at McCullough Peaks in that region. Uh, you know, every, there's not much vegetation or rain. But the geologist that comes out here, they look for evidence of what formation is underneath this hummocky, grassy surface. And lo and behold, of course, they'll find areas like we see here where I zoom in that, in fact, prove that it is the Willwood Formation, the classic red-banded Badland Willwood Formation. So with that information, we establish confidently that the, the slide block of the Hart Mountain, Hart Mountain is sitting on top of this very young 50 million year old Willwood Formation. Okay, I'm kind of... Uh... Uh, excited to be here with this tree level. Uh, I've made it up here to where we're about 800 feet from the top at the tree level and the ecosystem has just changed dramatically because right now probably 150 yards away I'm listening to a couple cow elk uh, whistling and calling to each other and it's a lot of fun. Well, I've finally arrived to a place where I can definitively, um, definitively talk about these big cliffs. So uh, let's take a look at some of this rock and the cliff face and the characteristics of it, and then we'll go on to the top. I'm going to turn the camera here and look at a little bit of rock so you can see what the geologist saw at the time. And if I had time, I would love to scramble over and get a on it. And I might see stuff higher up. So we'll see. So here's a big boulder as we look out into the basin. I'll turn slowly, sitting way above the basin, way out there, and swing around and watch. Yeah. Get the camera up a little higher. Big, tall cliffs, big, tall cliffs of the Madison and the Bighorn Dolomite. So that's the story here for this uh, little stop here on the trail. And we got to get on up to the top. And we've still got a ways to go. But the amazing thing to me to think about, standing right here where I am, <coughs> is that if we drilled a well, we would drill through this old, old rock up here. Then we'd drill into some willwood like we saw below on the hike. Um, we'd drill down, 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 and guess what would happen? We would come right back into this very same rock underneath our feet, 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet down. So that gives you some perspective. So here we are, higher up, and yet, Again, I see behind me just beautiful, beautiful uh, bighorn dolomite, Madison limestone up higher. What a beautiful hike and a beautiful trail. Spectacular. Much better than I thought. This is the first time I've hiked this trail.
standing on this huge block of, of limestone that slid out in the basin and looking way out over the basin, way above the basin floor, is pretty darn awe-inspiring. Boy, this is beautiful light as the sun's setting here, and I'm looking way out to the west. This turns out to be where all the slide blocks in this area came out from towards me. So let's zoom in with the camera here and talk about a couple things. Right here where you see this beautiful area of uh, grassland on this slope here, that saddle there, that pass, is where several of these large blocks came out from, came right out through that area. Now, of course, it looked a lot different then. You have to remember there's been a lot of erosion. This basin, this low area in front of us, was actually all a great plain. It was very flat. There was no erosion at the time. In fact, sedimentation, it was filling in. The basin was filling in with sediment. And so when these big blocks came sliding out, it was on a very, very flat, planar surface as it came out into the basin, unlike we see today. Now you see this way in the distance, this amazing peak. It's called Pilot Peak. And it turns out that the slide blocks came out from even beyond that, clear up past that to Yellowstone Park, this whole huge area that broke free, which we'll be learning about. You know, as I drive along here towards a little community uh, for our next stop, Clark, Wyoming, I can't help but think of those geologists that, uh, that had to get on their horse and, and use a wagon and ramble around, you know, it must have been quite a chore. Well, here we are at an amazing place, yet again, an amazing place in the Bighorn Basin and in Wyoming. Don't you just love Wyoming? I know I do. It's just, it's an amazing place to be. And I come here, uh, I came here for a very particular reason in relating to Heart Mountain for us to help us um, think about Heart Mountain and what could have happened and how the original geologist may have thought of the problem and likely did. I'm a geologist after all and I know how I would approach it. <clears throat> but off to my right in the distance you can see Heart Mountain and here is just an unbelievable fold of the mountains on the front of the Beartooth Mountains we call uh, on the Clark's Fork River where it, it comes out of the mountains and it's as you can see here it's just mind-blowing how the layers of rock come from even out of your picture frame it goes on up I can't get it all in I can't get it all in without going way wide angle and then you can't see other key things but the whole the big layers of rock come and they just turn and they go vertical. They turn vertical and go down under the ground, way down under, down into the basin. And by the time they get just a few miles out <clears throat> to the east, out here, these layers of rocks are 15,000 feet under the ground. Okay, it turns out that Heart Mountain the layers that we see in Hart Mountain are the upper part, those cliff formers up there. See those cliffs at the top that turn underneath? Those are the layers of rock that slid out into the basin, out here, whoo, way out here. Now it turned out it was back there a ways where it came through, broke through. through. But now we know the layers, the stratigraphy. Those are the layers that broke free those big cliff formers, okay? 
Another reason um, I brought you here is you think, well, gosh, look how high these layers are. They're way up. This mountain face rises 4,000 feet above the river. Couldn't they have fallen out just like a big catastrophic plunge? Uh, and, and that's how Heart Mountain got there? Well, that's a good thought. That's a reasonable thought. But you can't find the piece that broke loose here. This is all intact. This is all intact rocks, those layers. You don't have evidence of it breaking free right here. So you go, so you, you think it through and you hike along. The geologists would and ride their horses and in, in their wagons back in the day looking for evidence of how that big piece of rock on top, those layers, how a huge section of that got way out into the basin. In fact, there's parts of Hart Mountain out further at McCullough Peaks where we were earlier. There's actually pieces clear out there that slid out and even further. So, so it makes you think about this whole problem, right? Okay, so we know, now know the layers involved of rock. And quickly here, I've tried to establish that it's still, even though you've got them way high, they didn't plunge and fall off catastrophically in a steep uh, fall off the front of the mountain that, that could be a viable theory. So now, what does that do? Uh, tell us about Heart Mountain out in the distance off out here. Now we're starting to lean to, okay, I don't think it's a catastrophic plunge of rock. But we don't have evidence of the, the thrust faulting. So I wanted to jump in here and talk a little bit more about this idea of thrust faults. I've mentioned that geologists decided they weren't thrust faults, that this Heart Mountain and this big landslide wasn't the result of thrust faulting. Let me talk to you just a minute about that. I have a sketch of a layer of rock, this red layer here, that has been folded, the big fold, and then there's it broke in this fault. See this big, heavy, dark line? That's a fault in this sketch. And this blue arrow shows that the, that the top above this fault it broke this way. That's what I have that arrow for. So the rock basically got squeezed and squeezed and folded over and broke. Okay, that's very common in thrust fault terrains. We call these features compressional features. Everything's being compressed and squeezed. Now, it turns out when geologists hiked around all through the region of the Heart Mountain uh, area, what they saw were extensional features, signs of things being pulled apart. And that's common in landslides. Most of the features in landslides, there are a few exceptions locally, are extensional, being pulled, not compressed. They didn't see rocks that had been folded all over the place in that. And there are other things that you look at as well, that, but that's one of the main ones. So in the end, the important point is in the end, all the information says no, there was no thrust faulting involved in the great landslide. So now we're left with what we call the low angle detachment where things break loose on a very low angle, like two degrees, literally, a huge area. Now we're kind of thinking of that. And we start looking for evidence of that, right? Or we find evidence and then, and then start putting it together. And that's how these geologists did that. Here I am, uh, standing, looking down behind me to Hart Mountain. I'm up in the mountains. Hart Mountain's about 14 miles away out uh, down there. You can see it in the far distance from me. And I'm standing on a ridge west of it, high in, up in the mountains, along the Chief Joseph Highway, they call it. Spectacular country. And it's here we're going to start examining and looking at things that the, the geologists that studied this area, uh, that they studied, and see evidence for what happened to Heart Mountain. How did it 
how did it get out there where it is on top of these young rocks, right, that I've discussed? So let me walk over here and we'll look out beyond us to where we're going to be exploring, <clears throat> as the geologists did. So if I turn the camera around <clears throat> and uh, walk down here, walk just to the ridge, up here onto this ridge, beautiful country here, really spectacular. <clears throat> this is the country where nearly all the evidence that geologists found that helped them understand uh, about Heart Mountain, this is where all the evidence comes from. So this is the Clark's Fork uh, River drainage. On the right side of the screen in the distance is the Beartooth uplift. And then as I turn here and pan to the middle here, it's way out in there where the core of this um, giant landslide occurred. <clears throat> it's an area that's about 30 miles back behind me, back here, uh, over 30 miles where it broke free in Yellowstone Park technically. 30 miles by 20 miles, massive piece of uh, real estate of land broke free. And uh, so now it's getting exciting, isn't it? Because we're going to actually start looking and seeing what the geologists saw and start putting the pieces together and determining that that's how. And that's what happened to Heart Mountain. That's how it got out there. So let's go and start examining and seeing what we see in evidence to help us out, shall we? Sounds fun to me. Driving down off this big ridge I was on, I'll just call it the big windy ridge because it normally is quite windy up there. Coming down into the valley where we're going to be looking for all this evidence of the detachment. It's pretty exciting to think about what we might see. Well, here I am at another really very interesting spot on the whole Heart Mountain story. I like to think of where I'm at as one of the key, uh, key points that a geologist hiked to back in the day and going, aha, when he saw this mountain and some of the relationships uh, that he observed and that he mapped out this geologist, he or she. Um, and. I want to start by looking at the layers of rock. We've covered this some before, but I want to come back to this, okay? I am standing uh, on what's called, this, this little blue line here is called the Pilgrim Limestone. And this is a really key marker bed in this entire story because it helps kind of, it, it sets a framework to help us understand what's going on because it turns out the detachment is up above that just a ways right at the base of the Bighorn Dolomite and we'll be uh, looking that, at that further. So I am standing on the Pilgrim Limestone, okay? Rocks are deposited in layers like this that are originally very flat, okay? But every now and then, a geologist like here comes to a situation where he sees something pretty strange. You have your nice uh, layered rocks that are uh, predictable, we'll say. And then all of a sudden, you see layers of rocks maybe doing this as an example. Oh, boy. Now, there are a couple different ways to, to get this scenario, situation. Uh, and they're pretty easy to sort out if you have the information at hand for geologists. But let me talk about the one way that's important, and it's important here, and that's the detachment. To get rock that's tilted or folded on top of flat-lying rocks, if you have a detachment surface, meaning a surface, let's call this surface here a detachment surface, which is important to our story, okay? 
if you have a surface like that, that means everything above it was sliding around on top of this surface. It was jumbled and moving around. Well, you can imagine large mountains of rock like we're talking about here, sliding around those rocks, get broken and bent and faulted and all that kind of mess. So that is one way to explain this situation. So I made this sketch because <clears throat> That's what's happening here. And it must have been exciting as geologists came back to the west of Hart Mountain, into the mountains and mapping in great detail, they started noticing these types of things among others. And they started to go, hmm, where does it, how far does this detachment surface go? What does it mean? Uh, what's on top of that surface? What is the actual surface like? So, uh, and, and so it must have been, boy, I can tell you, there's nothing funner for a geologist than trying to figure out a puzzle, a puzzle in the rocks, okay? So when I walk over here to this edge here and show you some drone footage, footage of this particular spot I'm in, I want to sketch a, a couple observations. So to my left, Right, just like I am now, I'll be looking at the drone like this. We'll have that Pilgrim limestone, as I just talked to on my uh, stratigraphic column, the rock layer. It'll be dipping like this. Very predictable. It's a really great marker. It's a big, thick limestone. And I'll be, I'll put a little tree here. I'll be standing by this, I don't know if there'll be a tree. I'll be standing right here on this edge, okay? It's not flat, it was deposited flat, it's been rotated some, but above it you're going to see some interesting things. And I won't tell you what you're seeing until you see it, and I'll talk to it on the drone video. So let me step over to this, and let's take a look at, at what we have, okay? So here I am standing on the Pilgrim limestone as we back away here to reveal interesting things. As we back away, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what, what, what is going on here? We've got to stop, this, this is interesting. Yes, yes, look at these upper layers of rock here, these big layers of rock that are dipping quite steeply. They're dipping much more steeply than the gentle slope of the Pilgrim limestone beneath it. So this is a nice clue that, boy, there's something going on here, and there must be some surface, a detachment surface, in this region. So let's continue to fly up over the mountain to see more. And we see in the distance here the big windy ridge, and then this an immediate next mountain, we see similar things, don't we? We see steeply dipping beds, uh, in this area, and then over to the right, on the right side here, which is to the south, we see beds that are not so steeply dipping. Everything just looks kind of jumbled. Well, it's time to move on and drive further to the west, looking for more clues as to what happened here. I love driving this road in this beautiful country, even though it's a bit of a smoky day, there's still many beautiful things to see. Well, here we are at a really important place for geologists as they were mapping out this area. This mountain face that we see back here behind us, this very large mountain face, goes from here clear back around. That's like eight miles long, okay? And this turned out to be a really important area to see many interesting features that helped them to determine where the uh, detachment is. So we're going to acquire some drone video 
and I'll show you that video and we'll see what they were learning but it's sure a neat place okay I wanted to stop here and kind of set the stage with the layers of rock that we're looking at so at the bottom here we have the Pilgrim limestone which we're familiar with now and then above that we have the section of dolomites and limestones like the Bighorn Dolomite and some Mississippian Madison or, and other units within that. And then on top of that we have a big thick section of volcanic deposits that you see in this kind of darker color. Now I also want you to think about the processes here. Um, these, on top of these limestones here Originally, there was another, oh, at least eight or 9,000 feet, I'd say, of more sedimentary rocks that were there. And then when the mountains were uplifted, the erosion occurred and eroded it all down to the top of these, where this lime, here in this particular mountain face, this, about this much limestone, down to there. And then the volcanics came in on top of that and deposited thousands of feet of volcanic deposits on top. And then they were eroded too. We have to remember these volcanic deposits have been um, uh, eroded and continue to be eroded since for 30 plus million years they've been eroded. So of course when these volcanoes were active, it set up the stage to trigger this massive landslide that occurred 49 million years ago. I'm seeing something interesting in this area, are you? Let's take a closer look. Yeah, we can see these sedimentary layers here that are starting to turn and bend down to the right side of this image here in our zoom-in image and abruptly stop at a planar surface. So everything underneath this is planar, almost horizontal here. And that contact where we can see where it meets, that would be the surface of detachment. So now for the first time, we're starting to get close to understanding exactly where this detachment occurred, where everything broke free. Hopefully this will remind you of the last sketch I did on the whiteboard showing some of these relationships, if you'll remember. So continuing on, I want you to notice this nice distinctive layer here. It's about 10 feet thick. Very interesting. And that looks to be about where, where this contact is, where things change from dipping rock to planar or horizontal rock, meaning that would be where the detachment is. Let's, t let's keep an eye on that, okay? Wow, look at this area here. I'm seeing things here that are really getting interesting. Let's take a look. Yes, can you see this darker vertical seam of molten rock that's been intruded in? This is volcanic rock. And look how it ab abruptly ends right at that contact we've been keeping our eye on. This is very important. Let's expand on this some. Well, I wanted to jump in here while we're watching this drone video and insert uh, a sketch using my, my whiteboard here to help us understand what we're seeing. You know, we're, we're in the, we see this a vertical seam of dark volcanic rock that cups, cuts up through the formations. And then underneath, it abruptly ends. How could this be? Well, I made a sketch here of a volcano and uh, a magma chamber, molten rock underneath, and r molten rock squeezing up through, some right up to the volcano, but others are walls that, in fractures that come all around the volcano, kind of radiate out from the volcano. So there's a seam here, for instance, in this little sketch. Okay, now what happens, what happens when we have a detachment and we take a this whole thing and slide it. So I'm going to draw an arrow here. 
a big old arrow off to this side of the sketch, uh, which is to the east in this case, slides out, okay? And where is the detachment? Well, it's, I'll make it in this, for this sketch, right on this green line right here, okay? Right along there. Now, I want you to think, well, what happens when we cut everything and slide everything along that detachment surface? Uh, and that's the way geologists, they thought backwards on this to, to figure this out when they made these observations that we're seeing. What happens? Well, let me show you the next sketch uh, and slide it over, okay? Okay, so I've had a chance to re redraw this sketch a little with the mountain, the volcano slid over like we said, on the detachment. So let's mark this detachment. It's on this green line right here on this sketch, right, figuratively. That means that all this rock from here, all these layered rocks, plus a bunch of volcanic on top, all broke loose and slid this way. And of course, everything underneath is stationary. And so that volcano, and the associated dikes and uh, stocks or plugs in here slid over this way uh, from here. So it used to connect up here. Pretty interesting, huh? So this helps us understand what actually happened when we see the outcrop here on this mountain front. Because what are we observing here in this drone video? We're seeing uh, volcanic dikes. There are several along the mountain front, but this really nice one here. We're seeing one that comes from the top. You see it above the detachment. It comes down and it ends right here. And you don't see under anything underneath. The underneath part of it is clear out somewhere else. We don't know where. And also a geologist can find these relationships maybe somewhere else if you hike around a lot where you see a volcanic dike come up and abruptly end at the detachment because it was severed. It was just severed right off and slid away. So you can imagine when a geologist saw this, these guys hiking around out here doing all the hiking and mapping. When they see this, it gets really exciting because, wow, it's pretty unusual to see this, uh, just something that's just cut right off like this. And, of course, this was a very key piece of evidence to help them understand what was happening and to determine that actually it was a detachment, a low-angle detachment that covered a huge area. Hopefully, with the help of this discussion, uh, this mountain face and what we see here is far more interesting to you. So let's continue watching this actual detachment surface you're going to see some interesting things. I think you'll see some hints of vertical volcanic dikes. Now, they can be partially covered. That's how nature works. And other jumbled rock and things. Isn't this a beautiful view down this detachment line? Wow. And we're looking right out down towards Hart Mountain. So it slid right down the way we're looking. And I want to kind of back out and go in that direction because there's an interesting change here I want you to see. So we continue to move to the east along this mountain face towards Hart Mountain, the way the mountain slid. And we come around the corner and we see a different type of feel, don't we? We see softly eroded mountains, and more softly eroded. And the detachment's a little more difficult to see, but it's right here. And on top of it are softly eroded volcanics. Now, not all volcanics is hard and durable. You know, lava flows are hard and durable, lahars. But you have all other types of volcanic deposits, and some of them are pretty easily eroded, and they form these gentle hills. And so here we have all volcanic deposits on top of the detachment. We don't have any sedimentary rocks at all. 
it's all volcanic on top. Well, I've uh, gone up the road a ways. It's another day, actually. I've had to use several days to develop this video. But it's another day, and back, oh, right up that, can up that valley, way back there is where the Great Wall, the mountain wall was, that we filmed the drone video to see some of the things the geologists were looking. And a lot of sedimentary rock on top of that detachment there, as we learned. But as you come this way, if I turn the camera, <clears throat> I'll turn with it. <clears throat> There's some sedimentary rock in this area. But from here, as you go further west, further west, up the valley to the beautiful Pilot Peak and beyond, clear up into Yellowstone, still another 15 miles or so, most of that is volcanic rock that's on top of the detachment. I'll be hiking up a canyon right up in the middle of that big black point. That canyon's about right there. And we'll actually hike right up to that detachment and take a look at it. Okay, so here I am uh, going to be hiking up uh, a canyon near Pilot Peak. We're going to be looking for the actual detach detachment surface, just to give you a feel here. Be hiking my way up in there to this canyon. This is kind of tough going. It's a lot of fallen timber. And it's been this way all the way so far. So, the things we do to show you geology, I guess. As I hike up here, I can't help but think that the geologists that mapped this whole region uncovering this mystery. This came on later, but geologists hiking every nook and cranny. This is a pretty unremarkable little canyon up here with they call a creek, which I, I don't think it has water flowing in it very often at all. But it's uh, in, on the face of a very rugged mountain. And there you can get some good exposures. And that's what geologists are all about, is, is trying to find just the right exposure of rock to tell the story so they can unravel the mystery. And this is certainly one of the key places. Well, I'm finally here to where I can see the prize. It's been a heck of a scramble. I went too far east, got up high, had to come back down very steep, nasty slope through lots of dead fallen willows. Oh, if I would have been further west, it would have been so much easier, but <laughs> I didn't know that. But uh, I'm definitely excited at what I see. I won't talk about the geology yet. Let me give you a feel of what's up the canyon here nearby. Well, here we are to the place of glory, and it has been quite a work. Quite a lot of work, whoa! And I'm on a steep hillside here. And I'm, uh, as usual, I'm running short of time. I've got to start giving myself, take an hour extra, even, I, I don't know. I just never estimate right. But here we are. And this contact, see this beautiful 
white, it's dolomite underneath where my finger is, here, okay, and above it is volcanic rock. And this is the contact of the detachment. This is where the detachment actually occurred, and it is a, a it's just a hairline there and it detached in the same place over a huge area, probably 30 by 20 mile area, 30 miles by 20 miles, something like that, that this detached. Uh, remember we uh, talked about detachment earlier. So just to refresh our memory here, um, let me uh, get my drawing board. Remember, I talked about, you know, layers of rock, and that's what occurred. Now, I haven't drawn all the volcanic rocks, thousands and thousands of feet, 10, 15,000 feet, well, maybe not 15,000, but easily 10,000 feet of volcanics at the top of a volcano, these strata volcanoes that were on top, but I'm not putting that here. These are sedimentary rocks. So it's easier to think conceptually and then add the volcanics in later. I've got a little tree here for kind of, it's not really scale. I mean, it'd actually be much, much smaller, but just a reference. So these are the layers of rock uh, going up, okay? Nice layers, almost flat, about two degrees of slope. And then, wow, then all hell broke loose. Explosive volcanoes, probably multiple, but at least one, just rattled the dickens out of this whole area. Massive shaking and hot fluids and everything and came up. Uh, these fluids came, you know, into these uh, layered rocks, these uh, stratigraphic rocks, and, and it detached. What do I mean by that? Well, let's do this again. Let's put a fault here. Okay, I'm gonna take it from here. I'm gonna go down to here, and then I'm gonna cut across here, like this, all the way across. And I'm gonna remove some of this because these big blocks started moving. Okay, so they started moving like this, just moving across. And another one here, I could draw another big block over here, but detach. So this is the um, breakaway fault, we call it here, very steep. And then it broke loose underneath. And I'll put a little right on that line, broke loose. And the fascinating thing is where it broke loose. It broke loose right here. And this dolomite, this white dolomite, and it's really hard rock. And why didn't it break uh, loose in a weaker spot of rock? In fact, just underneath are these shales that it could have broken loose on, which are very weak. Now let's look at uh, some rock layers, the same rock layers we've been seeing with the bighorn dolomite at the base going on up to up higher into the section. And look at this where the detachment occurred. And this rock here that we're looking at wasn't involved in the landslide. So we can see, uh, it, actually, we can map it out and see exactly where this detachment occurred. And it turns out it was right here on this contact. Isn't this amazing? Right in this huge, thick dolomite, at the very base of it, only about 10 feet up into it, when underneath, as we see here, are these very weak shales. So we had to have some very special conditions for it to break free on that little hairline, this bedding plane, over such a huge area. It's amazing to think about and very surprising to geologists. I thought I would explain this more clearly, the whole situation about the detachment and how it broke loose in a strange place, so to speak. So I've made this sketch. Okay, let's start here. These two heavy black lines here, those are the limestones and dolomites, the hard rock for the most part. Underneath, 
I've got some green dashed lines that represent the very weak shales that we've seen in the uh, drone video, right? And then on top, all this red are the volcanics, the stratovolcano type volcanism. Now let me give you a feel for the scale. This volcano here is easily 10,000 feet tall. Huge stratovolcanoes. Off the flanks, pretty much everywhere in the area you would have at least 3,000 feet of volcanic material on top of these pretty much horizontally, they only have like a two degree dip, layered sedimentary rocks. Now notice this upper surface here is a bit wavy. That's because before the volcanoes came there was lots of erosion. Eroded like 9,000 feet or so through time of sediment down to this point here. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the volcanics, the volcanoes came into play. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think about, here we are with volcanoes. We have earthquakes going off everywhere. We have lots of fluids coming up through into these volcanic systems. And the seismic activity from these volcanoes, uh, the seismic waves and vibrations, must have been tremendous. And we think that could have been a contributing factor as to how this happened. Because if you, if you get strong enough vibrations and stuff, you could basically rattle loose on a bedding plane, like in the Bighorn Dolomite, and just break it free just a little. And once it slipped even just, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly the distance, but very small, a couple inches. Just break it loose a little. Now you've created a weak spot and phenomenal heat from friction that started to break down the carbonates into their components like CO2 gas and things. And they've done the work, the geoscientists have done the work to show that this occurred. So once you get all that frictional heat, you, you break it loose just a little, potentially, from the seismic uh, waves and vibrations. And now, <clears throat> now with the fluids from the volcanoes and everything, now you create what's called an overpressured situation where the rock is essentially sitting on fluid. And that means it's essentially frictionless. And now it can take off like a bullet. You know, we're talking 100 plus miles an hour. They estimate it could easily have been 200 miles an hour on just a two degree slope. Amazing to think about, isn't it? So this pulls away, right? Right here. I'm going to make this bigger. Like this. Okay. Woo! Slid out. Now, I'm going to scribble in a bunch of volcanics on top of here, way up here, way higher than where I'm scribbling. Huge volcanic pile, massive volcanic pile. Well, this, as this separates and detaches, it's not just going to leave a hole of air here, is it? No, all this volcanic uh, pile, as we call it, is going to collapse into there. And so, there are two types of situations you see on this detachment surface. You see a det this detachment surface sometimes has sedimentary rocks right on top of it where it slid and stopped. And other times where it slid open here, the volcanic pile collapsed on. Okay, And that's what happened here. Let me see if I can turn my camera slow here and see that. See? Up, 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 up. Oh, man. Whole mountain. And a lot of it is eroded. There used to be a lot, lot more. Huge geology. Huge geology. The last point I want to make is something kind of artsy. A lot of geologists are kind of artsy by nature. I love to paint, oil paint, I do photography. I really am appreciator of art. And geology is art. And the beauty that we see around us can often be created from catastrophe. And as you learn about how this all formed, and you think about these processes, for me as a geologist, and I hope for you, it helps you just even appreciate it more and ponder our place 
in this time and how fortunate we are to live now when we don't have these volcanoes coming over and getting us. Uh, but, uh, but isn't it amazing? I've driven up the road, oh, five or six miles, and the road was kind of in the trees quite a bit, but I could see something kind of interesting, so we stopped and sent the drone up. And now we're looking back uh, from where we've come from. Way out in the distance <clears throat> is the big mountain face that uh, we like so much. And right here in this area is the Jim Smith Creek. And now we've come up to here, and I'll just turn and look up towards Yellowstone Park. I'll turn this drone right around. And this is what we see. We see an amazing slide block here. Wow, this contact here is really stark. We've got the, the lava rocks from volcanoes right we uh on top of a very sharp contact we're familiar with that now and in this area i get the impression there was a lot of heat involved and that it's altered the shales underneath this contact to make them look appear you know very light colored as well as the limestone but just an amazing contact and out in the distance another 10 plus miles or so is where finally we hit the breakaway in yellowstone park so let's proceed forward up into that country. Well, I've come up here to the Great Breakaway Fault up uh, right, it's actually right inside of Yellowstone Park, at least this area. And unfortunately, you can't fly the drone up. And it's very difficult to see this breakaway fault from the ground. I thought about various ways to present you this information and decided to you just use a still photo here and draw it in. It's hard to see. I can promise you the geologists that have worked this to them as they hike it out and see it from various angles from up above, etc., that they're very confident and it's well established this breakaway, but it's hard for us to see. On the right side of the, uh, that red line, which is the breakaway fault, the trace of it on the surface, on the right side of it are all the layers of rock that are essentially undisturbed. You know, volcanoes, of course, came in and put lava and and uh, various volcanic deposits on top of it and now it's been eroded but other than that it was not part of the slide everything to the left which is to the east side that's where it all went all the way out clear out into the uh into the basin going on a long drive today going to be introducing you to some areas outside the core of the whole heart mountain story you know, we've seen the breakaway faults, we've seen big blocks, we've seen the, the detachment, and of course we focused on Heart Mountain. But it turns out, as I've mentioned, there are many blocks, and some of them were much bigger than Heart Mountain, and some of them slid a lot further than Heart Mountain out into the basin. So we're gonna be going to up near Cody, uh, to Sheep Mountain, and also way out in the basin, and, uh, we will learn more about this this whole mega landslide. Now, this canyon right here is where the dam is, just west of Cody. So I'm just west of Cody, and it holds back uh, the uh, Buffalo Bill Reservoir, okay? And this is on the highway that goes up to Yellowstone. Rattlesnake Mountain continues. There's a notch here where the river cuts through. And it continues back, 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 back to the north, okay? See it way back there? And that's a fold that involves sedimentary rocks, not volcanic rocks. There could have been volcanics on top. I'm sure there were that have eroded away over the years, many years, okay? And then if I turn, okay, we're back to the canyon. And if I turn the camera with me to look across the reservoir here, that is Sheep Mountain. Now, there are a lot of Sheep Mountains in Wyoming, it turns out, but that's Sheep Mountain. And that was a big block that slid out, like Heart Mountain. It's much bigger than Heart Mountain. And it slid about the same distance. And it has the volcanic, or the, excuse me, the layers of sedimentary rocks in it. And on the flanks and places, you see some volcanic rock as well. And, uh, 
you can notice that you'll see tilted rocks and bro you know like we've seen you know layers that have been tilted and faulted and and whatnot on sheep mountain like we've seen in other blocks well now that i have my uh, trusty whiteboard out i'll add to this picture okay so what are we looking at here in my crude sketch let's start with cody right over here in the green okay this is heart mountain this little oval here is rattlesnake mountain and then up here one that's the other direction of fold so they're folds is uh, Patahara Mountain, okay? And we've been spending a lot of time in this area. This is the Bear Tooth Uplift, represents the Bear Tooth Uplift. This represents the uh, breakaway fault, where the, the head breakaway fault, where it all turned loose. Uh, most of the uh, detachment was in an area, say, kind of in this area, up to this breakaway fault and down here. So, big area like that. Woo, that breeze is getting me. Okay, and now let's move down to where we're at now. Uh, this is the um, Buffalo Bill Reservoir, Buffalo Bill Reservoir, and this is Sheep Mountain down here at the bottom in the red. So we have Heart Mountain and Sheep Mountain, two big blocks. This is a beauty here. Within blue here, right here, the Buffalo Bill Reservoir with the river flowing right, it cuts right through the mountain here. Kind of an interesting story. Okay, so the, the blocks were sliding, some of them out this way towards Heart Mountain, and some out this way towards Sheep Mountain, um, west of Cody. And this, as I mentioned, is a big, much bigger block than Heart Mountain. It's about four miles by four miles or so. So there were two relatively small blocks that slid way out into the Bighorn Basin, and here I am on top of one of those two small blocks, relatively small I should say, looking out towards the Heart Mountain and the beautiful Bighorn Basin. But out in the light where I'm pointing, if you can see it out here, out in the light out there is Heart Mountain. And the biggest, highest lit up mountain back here is where we think this detached from, the geologists that studied this, it was part of the Heart Mountain detachment. It slid some 60 miles easily to where it is right now. We have, I'm standing on vertically bedded so it's been rotated, right? As it slid out, it tipped up on its side, clear out here. It's almost vertical, the bedding on this volcanic rock. And using dating and, and looking at the composition of these rocks, the, the geologists that worked it determined that in fact it came from the Heart Mountain detachment area. Likely right right across Sheep Mountain, uh, the uh, Buffalo Bill Reservoir and in that area right out to here. Crazy to think about, isn't it? Well, here I am on the windy ridge of Indian, Dead Indian Hill, as they call it here. We've been here before, but I want to repeat, we've been way back in this back country, 30 miles back to the Yellowstone Park border. The space 20 miles out through here, across here, 30 miles back, and this gigantic landslide that we've talked about came over my head, just a couple hundred feet over my head at the time, sliding out into the basin out in front of me here towards Heart Mountain. And I wanted to come here and put it all together and, and wrap it up, shall we say. So I've got a 3D diagram that I've made and uh, we'll probably do some sketches on the whiteboard and uh, just kind of review exactly what happened and, and tidy it all up. So let's do that. Well, I'm down below the ridge. I had to move. It was too windy up there. So I'm down below the ridge that, where the landslide went up and over in this direction uh, to get out of the wind and talk to you guys about 
the final, you know, the final wrap-up about this Heart Mountain landslide. Uh, I wanted to start with the stratigraphic column, remembering that we're down in the old rock, in the, in the Bighorn Dolomite, right near the base is where this detachment occurred, okay, as you'll remember. And there wasn't much younger rock that was involved. It had all been eroded away, and then volcanics had come in even after the erosion. So that's pretty interesting in itself. But uh, if, we if we look at this little sketch I have here, again, uh, here's my famous little tree. Here's the breakaway, the, the red line is the detachment that everything broke free on and slid around on. And this right here is the breakaway fault in technically right up in Yellowstone Park. And these represent the blocks that were sliding around. Now, some of them had bends in them, you know, folding, and they were faulted up. Some of them had big uh, dikes, volcanic dikes intruded up in them, and all kinds of amazing things. And underneath are just the layered sedimentary rocks here in the, that represented by these green lines. Again, about a two degree slope. This is Heart Mountain out here. This is the big ridge the big ridge that went up. Now, in fact, it looks big on this sketch, but if I drew it to scale, it's just a little bump. Because the, the blocks of mountains and these huge blocks that are five miles uh, across or so, easily sliding around and the big thicknesses, it was like going over a, a little marble. I mean, it's, it's really nothing. Uh, so I show I've depicted some layers that are folded or tilted and etc. Okay, and I've left the volcanics out of it on top for the moment. Now, let me show you a perspective drawing to show the whole region from a bird's eye view of this surface, this red detachment surface. So here, here we are, okay? The green is the detachment surface, this green area. For reference, we have the Great Beartooth Mountains on the northern boundary, so north is more or less that way here, south is more or less this way. Uh, we have the Great Beartooth Mountain uplift. We have the big Rattlesnake Mountain that comes in up, up to Cody, and in the Cody area, extending towards uh, here. Here's Pat O'Hara Mountain. These are two big mountains that are important in this story. Uh, the big block sliding around. Hart Mountain would be about right here, okay? And so we have this setup with these blocks. Some of them went out towards Buffalo Bill Reservoir in that area, and some of them went out towards Hart Mountain. And these two mountains, Rattlesnake Mountain and Pat O'Hara Mountain, were kind of like buttresses. They were there. So it wasn't this nice two degree slope of the, of the stra uh, stra uh, layered rocks, the stratigraphic rocks, okay? Uh, they were there and they kind of blocked it and, and wouldn't allow, of course, these big mountains of blocks to, to slide here. It stopped them okay, and diverted them, so to speak. And then we have all the volcanics the, of the Absorca volcanic field I've depicted here. In reality, they were here as well. But to keep a nice clean picture, I wanted to just show the blocks with the stratigraphic layers, schematically, and the detachment surface. Huge area. Remember, this is 30 miles by 20 miles or so that it, where it all broke free on. So I wanted to show you the real world now after we've seen my perspective view. And this is, of course, using Google Earth. And we're looking to the southeast out across the Bighorn Basin in the distance. And in the foreground, of course, on the right, we have the Yellowstone Park area. On the left, the important and great Beartooth Mountains, the Beartooth Uplift. And, of course, we see the outline of the actual area of detachment. And we have these two arrows pointing to these yellow splotches of color 
which are where the two major volcanoes were at the time in this particular area. Moving along here, we start to see some more details. Uh, first of all, uh, we see the big ridge here on the left that we're familiar with. And these two arrows are pointing to the main direction that these blocks went. Some a little more to the right in this view and some a little more to the left. We have Pat O'Hara Mountain here and also Rattlesnake Mountain there next to Cody. And actually here is the town of Cody right here shown here. So now to the slide blocks. It turns out geologists have mapped over a hundred of these blocks and we've only visited a few. Here are some of the key blocks that we have visited. We have the Sheep Mountain slide block. Then right here, this rather small one compared to Sheep Mountain, is the famous Heart Mountain as we know. Beyond it, just a bit here out, it's like 15 miles actually, is McCullough Peaks. And then way, way out in the distance was that block that we visited, the volcanic block way out in the middle of the basin that slid so very far. If we go back to my cross-sectional drawing, I'm gonna use some green here. <clears throat> I wanna put in the volcanics on top of all this. This Absorca volcanic field that was involved uh, 7,000 cubic miles of rock was extruded out of the earth there. That's 15 times bigger than the big uh, Yellowstone eruption. And it's much older. It's 50 million years old or so. The volcanics, the Absorca volcanics, where Yellowstone's only about 600, the, the last big eruptions, about 600,000 years old. So we had such a huge amount of volcanic material on top. Let me just schematically put that in. <laughs> Boy, that was schematic. Put a big old nice cone up here, you know, kind of like that, of volcanic material all through here in this green, okay? Huge area, uh, volcanics. Easily 5,000 feet of volcanics on top of these blocks or before the blocks even, of course. And then as it broke up, as I'd mentioned earlier, the volcanics uh, fell down, so to speak, collapsed into the, the space here that was developed between blocks, okay? And if it happened to be an open area, of course, there's pretty immediate volcanics, volcanoes going off to, to fill that in with lava flows, etc. Okay. So, wow. So Heart Mountain at one time had several thousand feet likely of volcanics from these big strata volcanoes, slid out, and then the erosion and stuff, and, and of course during the slide probably some of it fell off too, and then all this eroded down. We still have a lot of volcanics out here on top that have not been eroded even now. So, we've seen so many interesting things and we've kind of imagined ourselves as geologists out here making these observations and finding very interesting relationships, haven't we? We've seen faulted and tilted blocks. We've seen volcanics on top of this uh, red surface, you know, where it'd be between the blocks. It's just all volcanics. We've seen big uh, dikes of volcanic material, molten rock that squeezed up into these rocks as part of the volcanic process. We now know with studying of the minerals and, and the uh, chemical reactions that were occurring along here, that these blocks were sliding out easily 100 miles an hour, or 200 miles an hour. We <coughs> Excuse me. We know that that uh, the volcanoes, uh, their eruptions, rattled things around and got it started away, started off. And then you can imagine the heat from the friction as these blocks were sliding on, on that surface. And in fact, that we think was very important. It created tremendous amounts of heat, and that 
uh, created CO2 gases and the fluids were superheated and it made this slope of two degrees become basically frictionless and that's how it all slid out. With blocks sliding over to Buffalo Bill Reservoir, blocks sliding up over this big ridge, down to Heart Mountain and beyond. And now with all the erosion that has occurred uh, later to give us this amazing landscape. Okay, so I realized I hadn't explained a really important point, and that is how did Heart Mountain get on top of the Younger Rock specifically? Uh, let me get my stratigraphic column right here. And we've been talking about very old rock sliding out on top of very young rock, thousands of feet up here, right? How did that happen sp specifically? Well, let me come back to this sketch of the breakaway fault here you're familiar with. The block I've, you know, some blocks I've depicted. This would be depicting Heart Mountain, this slide block here. Here is the Great Windy Ridge right here, very important. This blue layer, I'm going to say, represents the Pilgrim Limestone, which we've talked about earlier. It's underneath the detachment. This red here is where it detached and slid along, right? Okay, so as these out in the area where the great detachment is, it was a two degree slope and a big, broad, relatively flat area that was uplifted. This is the basement. It was uplifted and eroded and then volcanoes came in. Okay, so, but out here is the basin. So here is the, the key point. This limestone plunges deep, deep into the basin, deep into the basin out here, okay? And all the rock above didn't get eroded. It stayed there, and in fact, there was sediment being deposited out into the Bighorn Basin and filling in the basin. The basin was full, flat, level, up to the level of Hart Mountain and higher later, but for now it was full. It wasn't eroded and rugged like it is today. And so these slide blocks are sitting here on this old rock here, and as it comes out, this old rock goes way down and it slides out over the top on top of young rock, all on a gentle slope out onto a broad, flat plain in the Bighorn Basin. That's how it happened. This is a nice view of the big ridge that we've talked about many times with Heart Mountain in the far distance. I thought it'd be kind of fun to, to show a simulation of blocks going up and over this big ridge. Earlier, we explored a couple blocks that were very close to this ridge. They were, are basically at the base of the ridge, these two giant blocks that, that stop before going up and over. It's amazing to think that there were many blocks that in fact did go up and over this ridge. I want you to imagine what it would be like 49 and a half million years ago to be standing on one of these giant blocks going 100 plus miles an hour up and over this ridge and out to Heart Mountain. One last thing I want to comment on is just how incredible fortunate I feel as being a geologist that uh, now retiring back in the Bighorn Basin in northwest Wyoming where I grew up and learned to be curious about geology and over the years I've learned so much about it and now I have the opportunity to share it with you here on with video and through modern technology and thank you so much for watching this and I hope you've learned a lot about the great mega landslide of Heart Mountain.